Hey guys, thanks for coming today to uh, Expressive Smart Contracts on Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves quickly. I am Gort. I am a podcaster. Go ahead and start. Hey everyone, uh, Willem here uh, from Botanix Labs, uh, founder and CEO. Grew up in Belgium actually. I have a cryptography background. Um, started building uh, Botanix two years ago. Basically realized that Bitcoin is the winning money and the EVM might be the winning virtual machine. And I wanted to put it one and one together. Um, and uh, we are building what's called uh, Spider Chains, which is a uh, decentralized layer two. Hey everybody, this is Charlie from BitLayer, co-founder of BitLayer. We started seven months ago. I've been in space since 2015, uh, early Ethereum, uh, early on Polkadot from 2017, brought a Polkadot to China. Had a big impact in Polygon, and orange peel myself from last year since all the notes. Uh, it's been an amazing journey working on Bitcoin space. So we launched on mainnet three months ago. I've been working on the Bitcoin verification pretty actively and uh, looking forward to the chat today. Hey guys, I'm uh, Tristan Dickinson. I'm the CMO of Exat. Uh, Exat, we talk about ourselves as what we, we call a, a docking layer, layer 1.5, which is main aim to, to kind of uh, expand the capabilities and interoperability of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Awesome, yeah. So on that note, I think uh, maybe if anybody wants to uh, whatever order hop in and uh, what are you what are you looking at right now and see as the demand like what do you want to enable with the projects that you're building um where do you see people wanting to use their bitcoin and what do they want to use it for yeah, that's a good question i think we've come on a stage in the history of bitcoin bitcoin is perfect store of value that was the last cycle um but i want bitcoin to be the money of the whole world i want the whole world to run with bitcoin as money and so when you think about all transactions in the world, like if you want to buy a house, you take a loan. I don't want to take a loan with a central bank or a centralized party. I want that loan to be on Bitcoin. I want that to be open. Um, I want it to be permissionless 24 seven where anyone can see it. And actually we've seen that play out already on Ethereum. You've got there, uh, you can borrow against red Bitcoin. Um, you can uh, have Bitcoin backed stable coins. You can get Bitcoin yields on Ethereum, but now I want to bring that to Bitcoin. Um, and so slowly I see this world happening where tokens are actually the new stocks, the new securities. Um, decentralized exchanges or DEXs are the new stock exchanges. Uh, market makers are the new hedge funds. Um, lending and borrowing protocols are the new banks. You will, instead of going to a bank to borrow for, your, for a house, you will go to a lending and borrowing protocol and uh, borrow against your Bitcoin. And that's how I see uh, the world playing out 10 years from now or 50 years from now. And that's actually a world I wanna, I wanna live in. And that's what I'm building for. Awesome. Yeah, I think I wanna add up based on what William said, a couple of things. So Bitcoin in the past 15 years has won in, mostly on the one important functionality, which is store value, right? You mostly can only do payments. There has no verification capabilities. Yeah, it's, it's not a tooling convenience. It's, it's UTXO cash system. So all the things which people take for default uh, in Ethereum doesn't really happen on Bitcoin layer one. And the demand really came from last year because the whole auditor season, right? People trying to have fun, inscribing all the assets, creating assets on Bitcoin layer one natively. It's basically, we call this Bitcoin version of ICO. Um, all these runes, uh, BRC20 really came out and if people wants to kind of creating things, you know, okay, how we holding these assets on Bitcoin, we had fun with it, what do we could do you know, to bring more programmability, right? Bring more DeFi on, against it. So that's kind of the, the demand come from. Right? The Bitcoin layer two, this term didn't really become a thing until last October because of the ordinals, right? Because the whole inscription summer came out. Audi or some of a few other assets become like mainstream listed on top exchanges and a lot of people in the community really had fun talk about that right we had a crazy interesting primitive across you know bringing gaming on bitcoin DeFi on bitcoin even metaverse so that was cool but uh, people realized you can't really do that much in layer one right you that's the kind of the conclusion we have to scale bitcoin there's two routes one is off chain like that's kind of what people are doing with the rgb and so on and then it's layer two though we call this bitcoin verification so whatever transaction you're happening on, on side chains, you know, from the previous attempt, like root stock or stacks, you, you don't really settle the transaction back to layer one. So it's a fundamental difference in terms of our trust assumption. If the settlement is not Bitcoin layer one, you don't access to Bitcoin security. And it's very different, right? We don't want just trust on the side chain validation and so on. So the bit layer, we want to work on this Bitcoin verification. We call this BF uh, stock, 
try to make it not sacrifice the security, but I still have the cost benefiting to settle things on back to Bitcoin layer one. Yeah. Yeah, and I think expanding just upon the Bitcoin use case side of things, it's really about Bitcoin becoming more of a practical use case outside of the crypto ecosystem. So to Willem's point before around using it as a payment method potentially for a mortgage or whatever other purpose you might have. So I think we're getting to an inflection point where Bitcoin is starting to become more mainstream. I mean, you know, Trump is talking tomorrow and that's a big unlock for the industry. Um, but I think really the next step in the evolution of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in itself is solving some real world use cases which bring a lot of practicality and value to everyday people that don't understand blockchain, don't understand the essence of creating a wallet, don't understand what a centralized or decentralized exchange is. Um, and I think we're heading in the right direction and I think we're getting closer to that. Um, but I do see Bitcoin as the kind of unlock for that, whether it's uh, what people know, whether it's the first thing they buy or it's the first thing they've heard, Bitcoin is kind of like the poster child for cryptocurrency. Also, the data backs it up, 56% market share, 1.3 trillion. Um, so I think we're heading there. I think we're in the right direction. And I think there are solutions and a lot of innovation, particularly in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, and I think it's a really exciting time to be a part of the industry that we're in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to add a little, a little bit of a, um, a counter argument in here. Like, what if we don't do this? What if Bitcoin just stays a store of value? For me, that's extremely dangerous. Like, what if all the Bitcoin just ends up with central banks and ETFs and doesn't move from a store of value to a medium of exchange? Then this whole experiment of, like, the best money ever, of decentralized money in the world, is failed. And so it is actually quite dangerous, and this is really, really important. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to press you a little bit. You know, we've had various versions of Wrap Bitcoin on other chains for a while now. We have Wrap BTC, Rem BTC. Um, can you hear me okay? You hear me okay? Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not super okay. Well, I apologize. Um, yeah, so we've had various versions of Bitcoin that can be used elsewhere on some of these other chains. I want to ask, why do you think that you guys will be competitive? I say you guys, you know, just collectively here. But why will this new... Um, season of L2s be competitive when we're talking, uh, you know, against Ethereum and Solana, where there, there is some liquidity for these other, um, you know, rap Bit versions of Bitcoin. That's basically the question why Bitcoin L2s when you already have wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum and you can already do everything there. Um, well, again, wrapped Bitcoin is a centralized company, Bitco, headquartered in New York. And if you think from a game theoretic perspective, and I'm, for example, the Hong Kong government, Right? I want to launch a Bitcoin-backed stablecoin, and I do that on Ethereum with wrapped Bitcoin, there's a massive risk. And that risk is that the US government seizes all the Bitcoin from Bitco. And we've seen that in history before. US government in, what was it, 1930 or something, uh, they seized all the, all the gold. And so um, that is a big risk. And so if I'm in Hong Kong or somewhere else in the world, that wrap Bitcoin, a centralized party that the US government can seize, is a massive, massive risk. Um, and it comes back to centralization. Uh, centralization can be very secure, but longer term, there's big risks. Uh, the human factor always comes into play. And so if you can do that natively in a trustless, decentralized way on Bitcoin, yeah, that totally changes the game. Yeah. We were talking about how to flip Ethereum layer twos, but I, we, we have to mention one thing. Vitalik was working on Bitcoin Magazine. He wants to scale Bitcoin in the, in the beginning, before he started uh, uh, Ethereum. It couldn't work, right? Um, and even before Ethereum, we had a color coin trying to have this as attempt. And at the end of the day, the reason we are talking about you know, the, the Bitcoin layers, we call this staking layer, programmability, programmability layer, and so on, it's at the end of the day, we see the demand, right? From the autonomous season, we really see be, you know, the builder culture, the asset creation come back to the mother chain. So the product market fit had an interesting validation from last year. So this is a kind of the big one renaissance, you know, the, the trigger from last year. Without all the nodes, without the tap, uh, tap root upgradation, I would think we wouldn't have this conversation. Bitcoin could always be this store of value, and I agree with William. If we just be store of value, it's going to be difficult to, to really say this argument, minus to have the incentive couple of rounds of halving before, uh, later, you still wanted to keep the contribution you know, on this you know, hash power, you know, whereas your block rule was getting you know, less and less. So we need a real Bitcoin ecosystem 
the fees will can pay, keep paying for the miners. So I have this argument with a lot of miners last year. In the, in the beginning, a lot of miners don't like the Bitcoin ecosystem. They were shit talking about ordinals, all these garbage UTXO. And, they, and then they, they actually flipped their mind because they actually realized, wait a minute, we're getting additional rewards as a miner because of all of the transaction happening. People paying gas fee, creating things. So that's a very important thing. At the end of the day, we need the miners to have incentives and the miners keep contributing the network and we have a long system, the future of Bitcoin. So how we achieve that is creating the, you know, all these programmable layer. So move all these Ethereum EVM compatible applications back to Bitcoin, let them access to Bitcoin liquidity, Bitcoin ap applications, right? So, and the, the more important thing is, Ethereum layer twos have all these fragmentation, fragmentation of a liquidity problem. They're hitting this middle life crisis. We talked about it yesterday as well. They're not as scalable as Solana. They definitely have issues with liquidity compared to Bitcoin. It's a huge asymmetric potential for us to build things. It's a blue ocean we're providing for all the dApps. I personally know so many dApps on Ethereum, and a lot of them have been struggling to really hit the, the threshold, right? A lot of them have been in this cutthroat red ocean of Ethereum DeFi. So if we really can open up this programmability capability for Bitcoin and verification as well, we could see a massive shift to move the DeFi summer to Bitcoin. And we don't, mention, don't forget about that. We are sitting on top of the 1.5 trillion market cap of Bitcoin assets. Yeah, I was going to hop in there for a second. Um, we've seen some of these issues with fragmentation of liquidity on the Ethereum L2s. Uh, I think as of late, there's been a, a good bit of conversation about this. How do you guys view this? You know, we have a, a number of Bitcoin layer 2s uh, spinning up now. How do you um, address this kind of like fragmentation of liquidity across these uh, various chains? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a, <clears throat> I might start with that. So I think the proliferation of L2s has created a form of fragmentation. If you think about a lot of L2s, they leverage off-chain data indexing, um, which is kind of logical to an extent because there's not a solution which has on-chain data indexing that's easy, cost-effective, but also timely, right? Because one of the big challenges of the Bitcoin ecosystem is around speed and interoperability. So I think there's a really big niche and a, a, a kind of there's a lot of room to grow and there's a necessity for a centralized to an extent centralized just in the sense that there's a, a technology which l2s is able to leverage from an on-chain decentralized point of view which then really enables uh, utxo data to be utilized and proliferated properly right and i think the lack of that kind of creates the issue where you do then need to have off-chain uh, data indexing and i think that's a core challenge that we've seen and I think that's part of the reason why there's so much fragmentation because there isn't a solution that L2s can go okay cool we've created an L2 we'd really like to use on-chain decentralized data but we don't have that so fine let's do an Excel spreadsheet let's do off-chain data indexing let's have someone that manages that so I think there's a need for this but I don't think there is a solution out there and soft plug for Exat I think you know that, that's why we're so excited about launching a mainnet towards the end of September, October, because we are creating an on-chain data indexing UTXO uh, platform where L2s can say, you know what, I'm sick of doing off-chain, sick of the cost associated and the risk. I am going to leverage this. It's cost-effective and cheap, but it also brings the transparency that the Bitcoin ecosystem is kind of known for, and it has a hybrid of POW and POS. Yeah, there's a few solutions we are actually working already. They're like the multi-chain a shared liquidity layer, essentially creating this decentralized program of Bitcoin uh, for all kinds of layer tools. So I think there's a few solutions kind of already tackling this problem. And I, I think I just want to revisit this, this uh, conversation that all these things happen, all this struggle, all this problem happen in Ethereum ecosystem. We know that in the last eight years. Um, so we're sitting on the giant's shoulder. What happened in Ethereum, we don't want to you know, copy the mistakes. We want to learn from the mistakes. A lot of solutions already been built, right? But they are Ethereum. They, we need to, we don't say copy from them, but we actually learn from the solutions and really just leapfrog. So I think that the Bitcoin ecosystem being growing so much and so fast in the last 18 months was because of that. So a lot of things we don't need to read when they will. Yeah, in terms of uh, fragmentation and technology, the way I think about it is a fragmentation of use cases. That's eventually what I think is going to happen. You have now, I don't know, all these different layer twos. They all use different technologies, are optimized for different trade-offs, and 
in the end, you have a huge amount of market. You have 8 billion people with so many different applications. And you can see, for example, DeFi, where the financial system will aggregate liquidity probably on one of the chains. Then you have gaming. Gaming is more suited for like very fast, can be very centralized. And so all these different use cases will find its own niche. And there you will have those uh, infrastructure network effects and liquidity network effects. And so that's how I see that whole fragmentation kind of playing out. Um, and then I also want to go back to the previous question. Why um, is Bitcoin a black hole and why will everything come back to Bitcoin and not stay on Ethereum? Um, is you have to take or think about it, like do a thought experiment. If I am an EVM smart contract today, and I have to make a choice. Do I deploy on Ethereum? Do I deploy on Arbitrum? Or do I deploy on a Bitcoin layer 2 EVM? That choice is actually very obvious. Like, you can be the first mover, you can access a trillion dollar market, there's no one else there. Or you can go to Ethereum, extremely crowded, first mover advantage has play out. And so basically, over time, you'll see that everything will aggregate eventually back to Bitcoin. And it's a, just a rule of law that all liquidity always gathers around the same, same pool. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I call the, the Bitcoin black hole. Yeah, so on that note, uh, talking about EVM compatibility, uh, my understanding is all, all three projects here are EVM compatible. Um, you want to talk a little bit about your choice there, and then also maybe a further extension of that. Uh, did you conclude that the EVM is the best development platform? Um, and have we really pushed the boundaries here? Whoever. Yeah, yeah, happy to take this. Um, is EVM the best technology? Absolutely not. Um, I think it's actually the least secure. It... Okay, awesome. We got a minute left. Last thoughts before we wrap up the panel here. One more minute. Any last, last words? Sure. Yeah, I agree. I, I think whatever um, Ethereum has, we already, well, mostly we have on uh, Bitcoin. Like a, a lot of EVM compatible layer twos came out, right? Uh, you can easily, using Solidity, copy and paste and do almost the same thing. So can we see more Bitcoin native approaches? Um, you said, you talked about Killer App. Um, yesterday I was basically listening to um, founder of Babylon and he said, uh, I agree, uh, absolutely. So he said, we're all waiting for the iPhone of uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, space. So what is it going to be? It's a question mark. We're still like testing it out and I agree with that, yeah. So we talked a lot about DeFi and so on. Now, if you want to dig into the truth behind L2s and you know the spicy stuff, come to our event on Saturday evening at Ord House. It's an L2 roast. You know, we're all being very nice on stage to each other. Well, it's gloves off on Saturday, so you can really get, you know, dig in and figure out what's real, what's not real, what can we do today, and you know what might might, might be a myth or the holy grail that we never reach. Awesome. Sounds good. Guys, thank you so much for coming up on here and giving your thoughts on the DeFi ecosystem. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We have another panel coming up on staking, so stick around for that as well. We're going to talk about Bitcoin and proof of stake and how those things thank very much. potentially work together. Am I staying up?